some of us feel a little bit sleepy. <laughs> and so we thought we needed something to energize us. And who better to energize us than Maud Barlow? She's a Canadian author and activist. For decades, she has been campaigning for human rights. And in particular, for the last two decades, she's been campaigning for the human right to water. Now, Maud, who lives in Canada, sensibly spends the weekend in a cabin in the woods with no access to internet. So she cannot join us live. Instead, I spoke to her just a few days ago, and we recorded a short sequence of her speaking about the right to water. So I turn the stage over to Maud Barlow. Very often we hear about water being a subset of the climate crisis, the climate crisis being created by greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> and there's no question that climate change negatively impacts water from the melting of glaciers to the warming of rivers and, and lakes, um, meaning that they evaporate more quickly and so on. But what does not get uh, spoken about or understood, in my opinion, is that the, the way we are abusing and misusing and diverting water is one of the causes of the climate crisis. We are using up the world's water way faster than it can be replenished from extracting groundwater far too quickly to damming the major rivers of the, uh, of the world to diverting water from where nature put it to where we want it. We could actually end every greenhouse gas emission in the world tomorrow and we would still have a water crisis. We have a separate, very, very serious water problem in the world and it's not going to be easily um, addressed until we see it separately. We've seen water as a resource for our, our uh, pleasure, for our profit, for growth, um, and we do what we want with it. Uh, we divert it where we want it, we extract it as we want it, we dump poisons and toxins in thinking it's, it's forever. Um, and we're not understanding that there is a finite amount of water on the planet. The demand is going up, the supply is going straight down, and the charts are startling in terms of that we are overusing the finite amount of water. We have to totally change our relationship to water. We have to learn from Indigenous teachings that teach us that water is, is part of us, that we are nature, and that we must uh, have reverence for water. It is not a resource. It is the essential element of life. We really have had this, what I call, myth of abundance. We know that we are a planet running out of accessible clean water. We Two-thirds of the world's population is now living in water stressed areas. When did you ever think you would read a, a report that said, can Europe live without its great rivers? When did you ever think that would happen? How could you think that England would be uh, living in drought? My country, Canada, we just were so careless because we think we have this myth of abundance. You know, everything is here and we can do whatever we want. We have major drought in British Columbia, major drought in Alberta, major drought in Saskatchewan. We have to start building the question of water and water use and environmental use into trade agreements. You know, what is the water footprint of this, this traded commodity? Uh, we know that over a fifth of the uh, water withdrawals every day have to do with trade, global trade, free trade. Um, and people don't ask the question, well, did, it, did the, the, the shirt that came from here or the wheat that came from there, did it impact the local water system? And if it did, are we taking that into account? And there's just a tremendous amount of water that's needed to produce many of the commodities that we use. And then there are also ways that you can uh, examine the, the footprint of your country. In other words, how much water does your country use? How much water does your country import? through commodities. It's called virtual water and this is the water that is used embedded into um, commodities or other products. It could be computer chips um, and if you are exporting that commodity away, it could be wheat, it could be cattle, it could be rice, you are exporting the water. Um, and that sounds like a good idea that you grow things that need water in places that have water and you export them to places that don't. But in fact, what happens is um, that wealthy countries, wealthy investors and corporations, big ag, uh, big mining companies go into places that maybe don't have so much water. 
um, and get these contracts to say, we own the water here, we can do whatever we want with it, dump our toxins in it or, you know, or, uh, or use it to grow food to send back home. Um, and, and, and it may destroy the local water table, but it's not our business because this is a, only about um, using this money, uh, this water to make money. So learning about your own footprint is very important. And it's really important when we think about the environmental concerns that we have, the ecological concerns around water, that we put it together with the human rights concerns. Because if people don't have a place for sanitation, they're going to use that river or that stream. That's the way it is. So we need to, we need to build these movements to protect water and to protect the human right to water um, together. There are a million people in the Los Angeles, Los Angeles area alone that do not have access to sanitation and clean water. So this notion that this is far away when you have in the United States, for instance, 1.5 million people a year have their water shut off because they can't afford it. Um, or you have many millions in Europe who have uh, no access because they're migrants or uh, living in, in communities where they, they're not hooked up to water. This is, this is an issue that's growing all over the world, this notion of who has access to water and under what conditions. The United Nations said in 2010, uh, water and sanitation are fundamental human rights. It's no longer an issue of charity. It's an issue of justice. You can have all the goodwill you want on the human right to water if the water isn't there. And we're in a race against time to preserve the, the, the planet's fresh water. If the water isn't there because it's been polluted or diverted to other things, good luck with that. I think that people are understanding, including those who say it's all about money, because in fact, if you need water for your industry, whether you're a bottled water company or a big industrial ag company or a mining company, you know that that water is disappearing. You know you better be part of the solution. I think we're at a turning point and I think everybody's ready for this conversation. Nothing is too late, in my opinion. We need to have an ethical framework that basically sees water as being sacred and sees our responsibility as leaving it in at least as good condition and hopefully better for the next generations than, than, uh, than we are currently doing. And we can do it. We can absolutely do it. I've been fighting to build a water justice movement for, I don't know, 30 years, I guess. And I've been everywhere from the poorest slums and favelas in the world to the United Nations. Those of us who live in some kind of more privileged situation where we can speak and don't get put in prison for it, have a responsibility to speak. And we can't say, oh, it's just all too much. No, it's not all too much. We have, we have solutions here. We can protect water. We can protect the human right to water. We can protect the precious biodiversity of this planet. And I tell you this, it will come back. Nature will forgive us. As David Suzuki says, nature will be kinder to us than we deserve. It will it will heal itself if we let it.